Yeah, let's do it. Are you ready? Brady. Chuck. Hey, buddy. Season two. We're back. We are back. Yeah. Are you excited? Uh, I'm very excited. Uh, yeah, you know, it's been a while. I've, I feel like we haven't released any episodes in a while, and I think about all of this stuff, and it's just good to get it out and let other people know what I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now they know I've been thinking about Blake Chastain. Blake the Chastain, first... <laughs> the first first guest of the year. First guest of the year. Appropriately so. He's, he's, uh, he's on fire right now. He uh, mm-hmm. was just on an, a CBS special. We're going to talk about that on the show. Yeah. Um, we got some uh, some some great, great episodes, episodes coming, coming up. up. Um, yes. We're doing a uh, gay conversion therapy part two, which well, is uh, an episode against it. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah, that's kind of. <laughs> I hope just that's make, implied. I'm just making sure you know I don't want just make sure everybody like, knows. Yeah, people are like, oh, how to finally, um, yeah, how to fix myself and yeah. what Chuck and Brady Brady's came up straight with this. now, and yeah, uh, yeah. we're gonna help you figure it out too for three easy <laughs> payments of forty nine ninety seven. Sixty nine, sixty nine, ninety nine. <laughs> um, yeah, we got uh, we got a few. Um, um, we... <laughs> it's just like four hours of me talking about the benefits of side and under boob. <laughs> <laughs> that'll that'll flip anybody, I think. Side boob. Yeah, I'm I, totally I do, kidding. I, I'm I totally do, kidding. I do like side boob, even as a gay man. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I am. I am more excited about this season than season one i mean i I think season one was really good but i think Mm -hmm. we got some really good stuff on the horizon um yeah just around the river bend just around the river bend we're on the uh we are we're way more organized this time yeah i Uh, I feel like i'm a lot more organized we we're both my brain works my brain works a lot more than it used to yeah 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 i feel like i've um crawled out of my cognitive whatever is wrong cobwebs. with me during yeah cobwebs yeah. of uh you started PTSD, writing again recently right complex ptsd um yeah i started writing um i'm essentially working on this kind of like three projects right now that are kind of kind of trinity in together and um i'm really excited about it cool um kind of trinity to, in yeah Did you I'm, trigger warning i'm wanting to focus <laughs> i'm wanting to focus on kind of like my my experience what i went through but also kind of um, have in writing some guides that people can do of like how to doubt their faith or how to deconstruct. And of course, you know, this is the beginning of a writing projects so when may change a lot before the time we get to the end of it. And you know, this podcast may not have any reflection on the, the end result, but, right. um, no, it's great to be writing again. I feel like my brain and creativity is finally lining back up. Cool. That's yeah. great, man. Long time coming. Yeah, 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 for sure. So, Thank I mean, you. all of that, well, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, play into the new season. Yeah, tell me what what makes you so excited about the second season because I'm um, very excited about it too. But I want to hear what's going on in our Chuck's hood. You know, we've we've just I just feel like we found our stride. You know, mm. like we uh, we, we uh, like a lot of we go into these interviews like I think pretty well knowing like what we want to like convey and yeah, that's like um, it's not like that we didn't do that last season, but I feel like we just have a really good grasp on it. So I, I just think the I just think the content is going to be really. Um, pretty uh, hopefully helpful for people and hopefully like concise and you know to the point and um entertaining that's a good point yeah i decided to be funnier this season i I don't know if you noticed that while we've been recording but (laughs) no not yet i'm trying to be a little bit funnier (laughs) i haven't at all actually i'm trying not to be the the (laughs) stip thanks brady (laughs) (laughs) the stick in the mud i'm trying not to be the the stiff that always has to tell brady to to cool it tone it down or i'm trying to trying to relax a little bit i don't have to be like an npr reporter you know the whole time so mm-hmm. working on that mm-hmm. working on my humor mm-hmm. i'm pretty funny guy i you're think doing really i'm pretty good. funny i'm pretty you're, funny you're doing, you're doing wonderful well thanks everybody for uh for coming back and listening and yeah, thank uh you. we're really excited to share this season with you we're excited to have you we're excited to uh hopefully meet you online or in person or um and uh and whatever just, crazy themes we have coming up next exactly put this thing out into the world and uh, and see what happens from it so very cool yeah welcome back everybody thank you so much for keeping up with us also just want to remind you all that we have um a patreon page yes we do like rate respond or rate 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 <laughs> review rate review subscribe rate review subscribe rate rate rate, rate review subscribe <laughs> i can't even say that it's so hard it's a tongue twister but uh yeah itunes all that jazz it's gonna be a good one man yeah 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, you know what? Before we go on, um, the I was thinking about what was that ex- that episode of um, Black Mirror where the the people die and then they live in the eighties. Oh yeah, the yeah. Uh, I forget what it's called, but yeah. that's what I want. Wouldn't that be really cool? Just like, um, <laughs> is this your a- are you pitching your afterlife right yeah, now? No, yeah, like the Facebook group and like the stuff that we have, like the Facebook communities that we have. I think it would just oh. be kind of cool if like we all just die together in a 1980s arcade and have big <laughs> hair and les it out in our in our 80s or whatever. I sh- I 100% share that vision with you. Hmm. I think we can do that. I think so too. Welcome to the life after. This is Brady Harden. And I'm Chuck Parson. And uh, we so our first segment. A lot of the times we uh, it's just me and Brady, sort of, sort of like you know, a puppet show, going back and forth. A little, yeah, like a Bert and Ernie, like a puppet show. Are we? Yeah, yeah. are we like uh, domestic hey partners? Hey, we have something here? to tell everyone. <laughs> so anyway, um, but our 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 guest today is the one and only. Blake Chastain. Hey, Blake. from Exvangelical. <laughs> of, of the Exvangelical podcast. Say hi, Blake. Hi. Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for being on the show. Um, so uh, It's like a crossover episode. Whenever the Harlem Globetrotters and the Scooby-Doo, yeah. they figure out that mystery right. together. It's like Kevin James on Everybody Loves Raymond. And then uh, Weird Al Yankovic shows up. Yeah. He was yeah, on yeah. Scooby-Doo. CW, one of those CW things. It was like The Flash and Green right. Arrow. Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure. Yeah. I have a friend who works on um, <laughs> those shows, and every once in a while he'll Snapchat me pictures of the set, and I love it. Yeah, that's cool. I'm really jealous. Yeah. Yeah. I'm him. jealous that you even have a friend that's in the, in the well, business. Well, I knew him from my um, <laughs> Christian sitcom days. So if if Oof. our podcast was a sitcom and Exvangelical was also a sitcom... Uh, this would be the crossover episode. This would be the crossover episode. Yeah. Do um, you guys remember TGIF back in the day? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. They did yeah. all the, cro- like, they did so many crossovers. Yeah. Wait, like, like what? Family Which Matters one? And, and Step by Step. Yeah. Family Matters, Step by Step crossover. Oh, I forgot um, about that one, but you're right. Yeah. Steve Urkel showed up, didn't he? Yeah. Um, I had a dream that I was on, on Home Improvement when I was a kid. <laughs> that would be an interesting crossover. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, our show in the home improvement. <laughs> well, Blake, I'm really glad that we brought you in to talk about um, 90s sitcoms today. Yeah, yes. if you haven't listened yeah. to if you haven't listened to Blake's podcast, if you like ours, uh, the I mean, you'll like the you'll love the content, you'll love the you know where it's at. Um, it, 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 we totally resonate on on the same frequency and probably sure. like 95, 99 percent of the time. So, I don't think that's how podcasts work. Uh, frequency. Oh yeah. <laughs> Tune in next week. <laughs> so, um, so Brady, I had a well, Brady and Blake. Um, I yeah, had, before we get into Blake's story and what he's been doing, yeah, um, we're gonna. I, I had, um, I had a, a something crossed my mind today when I was ooh, thinking about. I like this. <clears throat> so I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about the idea of self exploration, and I'm not just talking about masturbation, although I am also talking about masturbation oh um but self-exploration as it's like sort going, of a Chuck? big blank. can you talk a little slower Blake's like trying hard not to laugh <laughs> and his microphone. um but self-exploration is a blanket topic right so any any time that you are uh are actively um participating in something with the with the goal of figuring out if it's for you or not or mm-hmm. if it benefits you or if it'll help you get through x y and z self-exploration right so um, I, I am, I still struggle with self-exploration to this day in a lot of different ways because, um, in evangelicalism, in Christianity, we were taught that first and foremost, the Bible is the rule book, the, the basic instructions before Believe leaving earth, earth, if you la, will. La, 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 <laughs> la, 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 it la, always la, bothered la, me la. that it would say lie, <laughs> lie, lie. I, I mean, it was appropriate, Bible. wasn't it? They knew. Mm. 
<laughs> they knew what was up. Um, <laughs> shout out totally Salvatore. About that song. Um, <laughs> Do you remember that? That was like wow, two thousand one or something. So, uh, <laughs> we, so first of all, so first and foremost, the Bible is the is is where you figure out yourself. Yeah. Second is like you're supposed to go to God, and then you're supposed to like go to your community, your pastors, your youth group whatever your peers Mm -hmm. and that's how you're supposed to like figure things out so the bible has all of these i mean a ton of rules and a ton of guidelines and restrictions and so you're supposed to adhere to those as much as possible and then Mm -hmm. when it comes to things like vocation or you know your your spouse or your i don't know it literally anything like what kind of house you want to live in or something mm-hmm. it's like you're supposed to go to the go to these other routes and and like seek guidance from god and from your community and come to a conclusion and then you have like this set goal that you're headed towards so like you know a lot of people were like i really feel like i'm called to missions but like they're saying that as somebody who's never been on a mission trip you know because like Mm. ywam visited Mm -hmm. their church or something and then you know so then they're on this trajectory where like like, short-term trips which aren't really yeah 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 Yeah, for sure and and they have this like very tiny idea of what it means to be an international mission like long term right but their community affirms that suspicion or that feeling or whatever. And then, you know, they, they are set on that trajectory and then they start like, people feel like if people that are really serious about that kind of thing, like will get so far. And if something goes wrong, then they feel like they've done something wrong. They're off course, but it's, it's this process of like, you're not really asking what you want, right? You're not asking like, what is good for me? What works for me? What, you know, like you might be, you know, you might really hate bugs and yet, you know, you feel like you're called to be a missionary in the Amazon <laughs> where there are like undocumented species of bugs everywhere. Right. 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 So, right. Uh, as an example, <laughs> or like, you know, an ex- a more extreme example is like we've had listeners that have written us that didn't realize that they were queer until they left that system and gave themselves permission to self explore. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so, mm-hmm. I was I was just going to ask you guys like what's your experience with self exploration? How is it different now? Um, how do you how do you go about it? What do you what do you look at? What do you look for? And how is your how do you juxtapose that to your experience in in church? I'd like um, I would like Blake to answer first because I like this idea of asking a really intimate question before we get to know somebody. <laughs> so that's, I, literally that's the order that I want to do. do. Yeah, that's I wanna, the whole yeah. show. That's what I want is to uh, <laughs> okay. get to know you. Then um, meet you. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I I think <gasps> at different points and and we'll sort of get in get into sort of my to use some an evangelical term my journey mm-hmm. like oh, once yeah. we get into that a little bit later you know I, i've sort of had different spats and different experiences within evangelicalism and and all of that even and throughout all of those i think one of the things that was always sort of troubling was this sense of when it comes to something like media, uh, like that there were certain things that just were forbidden or discouraged. Mm, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and like just sort of out of turn. And I mean, so many of, so many people that listen to the show probably know, even before I go into detail, what I mean, like when you think about music, uh, I worked at a Christian bookstore, mm. you know, we had those. Same. Rec- yeah. We all, we all, <laughs> all did. Three. And we're, we're going to talk <laughs> about that later. Oh Keep yeah. Going. We got some yeah. We like, we had the Christian, we had, you know, the Christian alternatives, that chart, you know, like mm-hmm. if you like, yes. if you like this, if you like this secular band, then, you know, if you like the mighty, mighty boss towns, check out the insiders. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, you're right. The, yeah. Or, or the OC supertones or whatever the it might W's. be. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. Christian Sky was out of all of them was decent. <laughs> right. And the supertones were Calvinist like I was. So 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 in that vein, like at the Christian college I went to, you know, there were there was heavy restriction on the type of movies that we could watch. We couldn't watch rated R movies. Same. Uh, once oh. we were once we while I was there, they instituted this ABC system that was like uh, an A movie you could watch on your own, a B movie you could watch and discuss with a professor or another staff member, or a C movie was forbidden. 
Oh, wow. Uh, so the types of movies that Whoa. were A-listed were ones like The Matrix, which has heavy messianic overtones. Oh, of course, yeah. The Passion of the Christ, because, of course. Um, was was B-movie an A-movie or a B-movie? <laughs> 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 How can B movie be an A movie? The B movie was an A movie because it's not even an R movie. So it's <laughs> okay, <A>. okay. <laughs> um, oh, wait, so, so the I ABC mean, that is a uh, that was for <coughs> R rated movies, and that was a like an extra yeah. rating. So something could be like R one or R R A R B R C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so as an example, okay. an example of what they considered. So Braveheart was A because the violence could be akin to spiritual warfare. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. But, but the the Matrix Reloaded, the sequel to, remember... The uh, orgy scene. That was a C. Yep, it was a C. Yeah. No, no, no. Because, you know, you can't watch people having a good time dancing or sex. But also, it was you way more... Watch people be decapitated. <laughs> right, right. For sure. For sure. <laughs> which is totally fine. And, like, demons, apparently. Which is cool. Um, but Side it's... note, when I was a kid, uh, my dad rented Braveheart from our grocery store and was watching it after us kids went to bed. I wasn't asleep. <laughs> I walked in... <laughs> And I was in a doorway, and that guy got his head cut off, <laughs> and I was fucked up. Oh, my God. Just like that one moment. And that's when Brady found out he was gay. <laughs> yeah. Like, what is it? When, that, when the guy lifted up his kilt, because he, like, didn't he, like, right. flash him or something? Yeah, they right all did. They all do. <laughs> Anyway, anyway like, sorry, I'm sorry. Like, we keep yeah. interrupting you. No, no, it's <laughs> totally fine. No, I. So one of the one of the things that I sort of immediately thought of was the way in which our our media consumption uh, is often considered essentially, you know, like it. You have to be so careful about it. Yes. Because because uh, I I don't know if you remember going back to some '90s CCM. There's an Earth Suit song called "What oh. Be What We Behold We Become." Oh, oh my God! Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, so you know that was the that was uh, that that's the thing is that you know you you've got to avoid these these things and that that was sort of and for me personally that's how I do a lot of self exploration is by reading and watching things. Mm, yeah, you know, time, yeah, big time. Yeah. For me, for me personally, like. I sort of mediate things and explore things. And I don't know if you guys are into the whole Enneagram thing, mm -hmm. but I'm a five. And so like, you know, I'm mental and all that sort of stuff. So <laughs> that is important to me. Yeah. 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 Um, it's a way in which I can like live out something even in my mind. Um, and for that to be discouraged within evangelicalism can be really hard. Big time. Yeah. For the, for those of you who don't know what the Enneagram is, it's spiritual gifts, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just there's kidding. That's nine. a really that's a really bad oversimplification. You but. know what? There's even nine just like the spiritual gifts. Oh my god. Whoa. <laughs> I'm out. Triggered. That's three sets of three. <laughs> I get what you guys are saying. I think mine might be a little different because when you said that I was thinking vocation, because you know, whenever sure. I was a fourteen I is when I made the decision to publicly tell, you know, my church publicly that, Hey, the rest of my life, I'm going to be planning on being in the ministry. Right. So, you know, I was kind of like one of those like monk kids that you see, uh, like the Dalai in Buddhism, Lama. but like in the sense of like my path, what, I mean, it was, I wasn't nearly as disciplined as they are, but sure. like, that's kind of what my path had always been towards. And so for me to have studied anything else would have felt dishonest. And I remember even my dad trying to talk me into finding another vocation, something to fall back on just in case. Uh -huh. And I blew it off because like, you got that would have been a test of my faith because, and I, you know, I had the reputation of being involved with everything that, um, you know, people offered me jobs for the longest time. Like my first few jobs were ones through my church where, or another church came to me and said, Hey, we want you to be our youth pastor. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of like, um, I don't know, 
what is like headhunted almost. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And so it was just kind of like the most natural path. There were like what scouts I, in the pews. Always what I would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh yeah. <laughs> Bring it home. <laughs> Sports reference and sermon reference. Did it. <laughs> hey, oh, double time. Angels in the outfield. Um, so, I mean, that was kind of like always my trajectory. And even before that, like my job was to like find people to do devotionals or to fill in whenever I could. So I had a very unique skill set um, as a kid, uh, like a teenager, 16 was when I was offered my first job. And uh, I just, I had a weird skill set. I was a youth pastor by 19. So my entire life was built towards that. And whenever that got yeah. pulled away, I was like, oh shit, yeah. uh, the fuck, what the fuck's going to happen now? You know? Um but also what you were saying about media consumption, that was uh, strange for me too, because my brother, he went down the bad path, you know, oh, after my parents divorced. Oh, so, right. So you had like a, you had like a life example of what happens yes, when like, you listen to Eminem. Mm-hmm. No, we were, honestly, we were a very like <laughs> Did long Did you lose yourself out. in the moment? <laughs> I don't get that joke. Is that an Eminem lose thing? Lose in the music, the moment. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, it's a really, it's really Eminem popular song. song right? I just remember the movie 8 Mile. <laughs> that like, was that's him, right? From the, that song is that's from that movie. Okay, I would recognize yeah. it. No, my brother, he got into Grateful Dead. Oh no! And then, um, <laughs> so I was really I was a prude about music. I only listened to classical music. Then I listened to the Muppets, like <laughs> and I was like fourteen. <laughs> something when this is happening. Oh, that's and then rough. I went from the Muppets to the Muppets. I, w- I was invited my friends Joel's birthday, and I went there and I gave him DC Talk Jesus Freak. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then after a while, I was like, I wonder if I could have a CD like that. But I didn't want to listen to hard music because that was the trajectory of my brother. The way that I saw it was he started listening to. Hard harder music yeah then he started doing drugs and he started getting into jail and like and so it was like this ongoing thing and i thought if i started listening to hard stuff so it was the gateway my gateway that i was most afraid of do you know what it was uh when i started listening to music i started listening to one that was too hard so i gave it to our friend ryan and that was five iron frenzy because i was afraid that that hard music <laughs> might start chipping away at my soul and my innocence <laughs> The handbook for the sellout was gonna take you down. Yeah, <laughs> is that stupid? That's, that's crazy. Yeah. That's really crazy. But I. But um, it's that's exactly it's exactly what I mean, mm-hmm. right? Because there was a lot that you could have learned about yourself from listening to totally different music. I mean, you oh, know, God, yeah. I mean, even in terms of like, let's talk about you know, like racism and evangelicalism. Yes. It's like listen to mm. some fucking hip hop. And like maybe you'll understand like what it's like for an entire people group to be traumatized. You know what I mean? Like right, right. And yeah, yeah, so it's like I mean it's this toxic machine of like don't like you are not just like discouraged but but afraid of self exploration. Well, let me ask you this: and what are some of the things that got you out of it? Because. You know, Chuck, you know the friend group that helped get me out of it in my early 20s, I feel like. You know, uh, we were more progressive, more liberal. I was still very, like, theologically conservative. But, um, you know, we had more of the Shane Claiborne. We were able to be a little bit more liberal and kind of get out of there. That did fucking wonders for me, to Mm -hmm. just drive to the city and not just be stuck in Arnold, Missouri, Mm -hmm. which is my hometown, you know? Um, I was basically a homeschooler without homeschooling yeah, yeah, yeah so that helped me what were some of the things that got you guys out of your all shells uh, my process was really gradual um i you know like what like i was bad like when i was 14 i got caught with a like listening to a ludicrous cd in my room with my friend and mm. i got in big trouble you know Mm. Um, so like, uh, you know, it it was like a gradual process because like 14 year old me was aware that the content of that CD, however, like, you know, offensive or like sexual or otherwise was like, I was sitting there enjoying the music and thinking like, yeah, I can't do any of this stuff. You know what I mean? So Mm. I was aware that it was like, Mm. like I, Mm. I had my own, I had my own functioning (laughs) filter 
as a as a teenager listening to yeah. music with really bad lyrics. Like I, you know, I was a big Limp Biscuit fan. You know, it was just like I wouldn't. Is that better I wouldn't or worse than Five Iron Frenzy? It's just on way, a scale way, way, way worse. worse. Okay. It's so it's so bad. I mean, mm. like I'm not even talking about the lyrics. I'm talking about the music. <laughs> um, but, but like I, you know, I had my own filter and I had my own trajectory and I knew what I what I wanted out of life and I knew what I would like what being a moral person meant and I knew that a lot of this stuff was was not you know for me like I was doing my own self-discovery and and then like intermittently like somebody from my youth group or something would be like oh you need like we need to stop listening to this bad music let's get rid of it like one time one of my friends literally grabbed a cd out of my cd player and threw it in a sewer because it was like explicit content or something. When I was you know? a youth pastor, I hosted a uh, CD burning. Did you? Yeah. See. <sighs> so for me, it was like I was I was in the back of my mind, aware for years and years that that I was capable of like being dis- discerning mm-hmm. when and listening to music. Yeah. So it was like not a big deal for me to like ease in and out of that world and like oh I'm gonna watch this R-rated movie because it's artistic and I enjoy it even though like I know people in my community would discourage this. So I just like eased into it until I like finally left, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But it it was, it wasn't like I, I, you know, it wasn't like I was listening to the Muppets when I was 14 or anything, but yeah, that'd be ridiculous. But it it was a, it was a process (laughs) and that, and you know, a lot of that process and the questions that like watching a Paul Thomas Anderson movie you know, with like a really brilliant commentary, on, like like Magnolia that has this brilliant commentary on like grace and and forgiveness and and wrath and like judgment. You know, like I take that in and I'm like, oh shit, this is a movie about like the Old Testament God, effectively, and that assisted me in my deconstruction. So it's like self exploration was was the it, it liberated me. You know. Like my willingness to be somewhat rebellious when it came when it came to like media, um, liberated me. You know, I like that. <clears throat> On the other hand, self expo- the the limited amount of self exploration I was allowed to do in terms of sexuality, or like the ways that I did self explore, like only ex- like my only sexual experiences from like twelve to twenty twenty one something were porn right which is unhealthy horrible storytelling (laughs) yeah right yeah i know all that yeah i thought that was acting you know and i Mm. no but i mean you know that's like it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with porn but like that being your sex school for yourself and for discovering what you like is like only part only partly functional right like brady might discover that he's gay by looking at gay porn but beyond that you're not learning anything about what you like about the nuances of being sexual with another person and so in that way the 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 change that were on my self-exploration in in terms of sexuality were really harmful for me and it took me years i probably still working through some of that you know in oh. some ways i think yeah i'm just working through everything what about you blake what kind of got you to um get out of your shell um, so I think uh, to sort of stay in that sort of media vein and in regards to that part of exploration, um, I I was actually more of like a self-imposed sort of thing. It wasn't it wasn't like my I, I wasn't seeing restrictions from my parents or from a, from a church for a long time. Um, but it was just like this vested interest in in like being being a good Christian basically, uh, and sort of thinking that that was the way you acted it out. So actually one of the, one of the things really ironically was the writings of Philip Yancey. So talk about oh, being yeah. in a Christian bookstore. Um, What's so, so amazing I about was, Grace? I was, um, I was working in a Christian bookstore all through high school. Um, and I'll probably talk about this a little bit in the next section, but I was, while I was there, I, basically spent all my money at the bookstore because they gave like ridiculous discounts, like 35%. Um, so I would just buy books and he actually featured really good authors. Like he would quote at length from like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and, and Henry Nouwen, who 
I didn't learn until one of his later books. He and Yancey and most people didn't even know until now and past, but Henry Nouwen was closeted. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, fantastic writer. You, when you learn that about him, like you see, you see the work in, in, in a different way. Yeah. Uh, and the sorts of things that he talks about. Um, and like he, he reading those books led me to those other books and then those books led me to more ones. And then like my, my world started to, to expand. And it was like, the weird thing is, is that so many evangelicals just need a little bit of permission, just the tiniest bit yeah. of permission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if you give them that, um, then they can take that first step. And that's what I needed. And that's what I sort of got there. Um, and then that was, that was one of the things. And, uh, as I started to get in college and everything, and I similarly felt like an early call to ministry and that sort of thing. Um, I sort of ran into things I disagreed with and that made me have to question things more too. And Mm -hmm. that made me, made me braver too in that respect. I like cool. that. Awesome. Yeah. I explored mostly through my Sims. <laughs> I would have the boy Sims flirt with the other boy Sims. <laughs> and I'd be like, mm, that's a handsome Sim. And then you would like, you would put them in a room and erase the door. Woohoo, woohoo, woohoo. <laughs> that's what Sim sex is called. Uh, On that note. <laughs> yeah. Let's go on a break and, uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, yeah, you know what? Let's go on a break. I when was going to say, back, like, um, it's good. It's a good. Yeah, now that we, uh, know you, uh, Blake, let's. <laughs> we can ask even more intimate questions. Now let's meet you. Let's yeah, hear your totally story fine. and, uh, all that right back after this. Message from us. <laughs> hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon. It's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> and we're back. Blake, uh, you were in Chicago area. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I live in the city. And uh, what area did you grow up in? I actually grew up until high school. I grew up in a small town in Indiana. Um, it's between Lafayette and uh, Indianapolis, so it's like in central Indiana, um, and pretty small town, like around sixteen thousand. And then when I was in high school, my family moved to the suburbs of Chicago. Like Mount Prospect? Did you ever live in Mount Prospect? No, I lived in Naperville, which is where, um, oh shit, what's that one Netflix show with the guy from Arrested Development? Um, Ozark? Ozark, yes. So the family in Ozark is from Naperville. Oh, like, that's right. In, before they go. Okay. In like episode one or whatever, before or whenever. I haven't watched the show. There's too much Netflix stuff. It's I watched w- Sabrina. <laughs> yeah, no, it's they're all wonderful shows. Well, the reason I ask about Mount Prospect is that is where Rayford Steele lived, uh, who was the oh, pilot. Oh my in God! Stop behind, Brady. <laughs> That's where he lived. Fuck he off. lived in the suburbs. Fuck all the way off. No, but when I was a kid, we went up to Chicago, and I convinced my family to go out of the Rayford way Steele. to stop by Mount Prospect so I could get a newspaper with their name on it. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, I was that kid. Oof. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Wow, well, it's, it's uh, I mean, so yeah, Jerry Jenkins and Tim LaHaye are Oof. both were both at Moody, which is in Chicago. Oh, so yeah. I think that's probably why they why they put one of their characters from <laughs> the area is because of that. So it makes sense. Yeah. I like it. it. Makes it more real when you I can see it. It makes map. it more real. Mm-hmm. I did give uh, like the first copy or the first book in the Left Behind series to my voice teacher in high school, I think probably as a low-key witnessing sort of thing. Oh, yeah. But uh, he 
he rather wisely read it basically in the same vein as like Harry Potter. <laughs> he was like, this is, this is as ridiculous. And just like Harry Potter, <laughs> that's the, sh- that's a really shitty Harry Potter because like they have powers they can do. This is just a God who's pissed off and he's like fucking people over. It's like, <laughs> just seven years of torture by God. <laughs> and it's like, Oh yeah. <laughs> Christian. Well, that was, his, that was probably his really nice way of, of just letting me down, you know, mm. or like of just just settling me down so that he could get to. Or it's his, his way of re- saying "fuck off." He's like, <laughs> "Yeah, it's yeah. just like Harry Potter." And you're like, <laughs> "No, it's not. It's so much more real than that." That would have been me. <laughs> it's so much yep. more real. So yeah, you would. That would have been you. This is the future in this college. Is the future. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to Muppets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Blake, um, so you, what was your, what was your church experience like? Your, your parents were, were involved in church. You were involved in church growing up. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I feel like the story is, it's, I don't know. Tales all this time. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah. So my early church experiences were, uh, fairly positive, I would say. Um, the interesting thing is I, I grew up again in a small town uh, and we went to United Methodist Church, which is a mainline denomination, but it is one of the ones that, at least in my experience, has this tendency to sort of take on the local flavor, or the local culture. Um, so if you are in a small town in the Midwest, it's probably going to be more conservative. But if you go to United Methodist Church here in Chicago or go down to like the Methodist Temple or one of the neighborhood Methodist churches here in the city, it's probably going to have rainbow flags. So one of the things about United Methodist that is a little different than a lot of, uh, you know, more fundamentalist backgrounds is or denominations is that there are women that are pastors. So my earliest pastors, the first couple that I remember were women. Um, Mm -hmm. So that was never part of my experience. Um, And my early sort of church experience was, again, sort of positive and um, more sort of my early memories are more about just senses of like reverence and God is this really big entity sort of thing, not necessarily scary. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> there's also sort of more high church. It wasn't like as high church as an Episcopal service, sure, but there was call and response, that sort of yeah, thing. There's, there's some liturgy in, in Methodist. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, when I moved to the Chicago area, I moved at the end of my freshman year of high school um, so it was only like the last six weeks of school. I didn't really hit it off with that many people. Um, and it was sort of a culture shock because I went from this small town to a town of over a hundred thousand. Um, and I just didn't, I didn't make any connections. So like that summer, I mostly spent hanging out with my sister who was also sort of a fish out of water. Um, and then that following year I got plugged into a youth group. And it was, again, at a United Methodist Church. But one of the things that's interesting about evangelicalism and speaking to two other bookstore <laughs> employees, mm-hmm. Christian bookstore employees, <laughs> like, um, you, evangelical sort of material can infiltrate through those through those bookstores and other, other things that those publishing houses make. Yes. And that's what happens. Oh, so you're right. oh, I've never thought about it on those terms. That's so really that's, interesting. Yeah. So that's, that's one to, to me. And from my experience, that is like, it's presented as just blanket Christian, you know, Evan, right. all these evangelical publishing houses, all these things, they make these youth group resources and all this stuff, you know? Um, and, and that's gobbled up by places that, aren't necessarily evangelical and they Mm -hmm. can sort of pass that thing, those things on. And if you have a, someone that's a volunteer or didn't go to seminary or whatever, Mm. um, then, you know, they might not know the difference. Um, and they're just reading from a pamphlet or something a lot of times, you know? Yeah. And I mean, yeah. Uh, So you got, you got kind of sucked into the evangelical vortex via books. (laughs) To a degree, but I mean, yeah, there, there was this like, I don't think that my youth group would would have been much different than any other like in the late 90s, early 2000s evangelical youth group that was happening. Um, I don't know if 
you guys are you guys remember or saw this but at some point in in that when i was in high school like it was literally like a newsweek cover of like the Jesus kids or whatever. Uh, and to me, I, yeah. saw that as like a, I saw that as like, as like a point of pride. It's like, yeah, we're revival we're the news. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, uh, we're taking our generation for Jesus or whatever. Um, and so that was, that was sort of my early exposure, but that, but like purity culture was there purity culture, you know, uh, all of those different elements of things were there. Um, so, that was sort of this, the sort of exposure that I had. And I personally just had this motivation to learn about religion. Um, I was just a very sort of religious person. I do have this version of uh, a, a type of epilepsy called focal epilepsy. Um, there is some indication that epileptics have this tendency towards religiosity. Um, so that might be something that, that, that bleeds into this or uh, affects me in a way that I can't necessarily articulate or separate. Mm -hmm. Um, but regardless, like, you know, I was always sort of motivated and I was, my motivation was steered in towards this sort of evangelical bent, um, because those were the things that were available to me mm -hmm. because I didn't know. And because that's the thing about evangelical, materials is that they don't say they're evangelical up front, you know, they just say they're Christian. Right. And it mm. was, you know, yeah. um, and well, cause not, I feel like they're right. They're the right brand. They are the I correct Christians. Pete Holmes says whenever he describes like the Christian he came from, it's like, he'd be like, yeah, there was Lutheran, there's Catholic. And then there's just us Christian. Like we're, yeah. the, right. yeah, we're the ones yeah, who got, yeah, it, you yeah, know, yeah, for sure. it, but yes, that was that, kind of like the attitude that we that had. That monopolistic too. claim right. on truth. Yeah. Which is weird because yeah. like every fundamentalism, every denomination <clears throat> kind of has to do that even to each other. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 Anyway. I mean, it's that, yeah, it's that, it's that post enlightenment it's modernism. It's the, we have to have the correct answers. Um, and then that's what causes, that's what results in evangelicalism. That's what results in all of those denominations feuding with each other before that, before the enlightenment, it was like, I, I don't know. Right. It and was, it's a, it's a reaction to it, you know, especially mm -hmm. like biblical high criticism and this sense yes, of, yes, exactly. And this sense of like the, the ways in which in the 19th century they started really articulating how the Bible was constructed textually, you know, and, and fundamentalists reacted against that so mm -hmm. severely that they, that they really dug their heels in and said, no, just the Bible is what it is. And like, uh, and they've been doing that ever since in a lot of ways. <laughs> uh, so you're, so your um, process of, deconstruction if you don't mind me kind of like jumping ahead to that was it seems like it was uh, closely tied to the politics of 911 is that fair to say yeah so that actually did have this there were there were two things that happened um while I was in college so in high school I felt this call to ministry so I chose to go to a Christian college because I thought why not get a head you know jump start on on my theological education and instead of just waiting till seminary, like, you know, go to a Christian college that specializes in this stuff, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, I ended up choosing, um, a school called Indiana Wesleyan. Um, and it's, I didn't really know much about it. Um, but it, Wesleyanism is actually a more conservative form of Methodism. Mm -hmm. Um, so at, at college I was, the reason I gave that context is be, I was a history, I was a double major. They really pushed that in the history department. I was a history and biblical literature double major. And within the history department, there was a very sort of dogmatic professor that pushed what he called the biblical Christian worldview, um, which was this really fundamentalist thing. And that I'm just recently starting to be able to articulate as this like Christian reconstructionist sort mm -hmm. of vein of thinking. Um, and because he didn't necessarily credit that, that those schools of thought, he just presented it as, you know, this is the message from upon high or like this is the only sort of acceptable way to think that is in line with the Bible. Um, and a lot of that was really problematic for me. 
um, he taught these these lessons on on he was he specialized in sort of pre Civil War history, mm-hmm. and then he also taught something he called Western intellectual and social history, um, which was an interesting class and gave this sort of survey from like Plato to the present, um, but mm-hmm. with an extreme bias, of course. Um, but he he said really problematic things, like he thought that chattel slavery, uh, the slavery of African Americans, and w- should have been they should the slaveholders should have been monetarily compensated hmm. for Whoa. their chattel. Sla- <laughs> it's like what? Are you kidding me? Wait like, for what? That's just, that was just sort of my my reaction, you know, in those classes was, are you kidding me? Like you yeah. expect. You think it was was appropriate for it would have been appropriate in that time yeah. for them to have been paid for people. Yeah. Like fuck that. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's, yeah. that's just that's just messed up. Um Wow, that's insane. Okay. Well, that, that would even uh, be a takeaway from that. Yeah, yeah. You know, Right. That history, yeah, at that point in history, be like, oh, well, these guys really got screwed over by not getting their money. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. That's horrible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there there were there were things like that in, in different uh, lessons that were like, really like, how can you believe this? And then it was very, very mm. strongly, uh, like strong armed into into Republican politics. So he kind of like um, drew a line in the sand and was like. You have to pick a side. Are you going to be, you know, 100% with me or is that going to mean you're 100% against me almost? Right. Yeah. And so, and so I, I really reacted against that, Hmm. um, because I was in exploring my faith very earnestly and exploring the teachings of Jesus. I was actually becoming more pacifist. I was becoming more, uh, more accepting, hmm. uh, more inclusive, um, and that just did not jive. And then there was another there was another element of being also in the biblical liter- literature program, of learning about how the Bible was constructed, learning and learning biblical Greek, and just how up for debate the text itself is, mm-hmm. uh, and not just like what the text means, but how it was constructed. And like that was a real eye opener for me mm. and was in a lot of ways, this major, major crisis of faith that I wasn't expecting mm-hmm. because I didn't really necessarily realize that I had assumed that the Bible was inerrant, um, that the Bible was just this thing without fault. Mm. Um, and to learn that it wasn't, uh, that so many things like, uh, when you, when you sort of assume that the Bible is, is without fault. And then you have a professor mention that, you know, this text may not have been written by Paul at all. Yeah. Um, and we just don't, we don't know for sure. We like, we learn more and more every day about how these were, these were developed. Um, but we're not sure, you know, this, we have very good, like getting into those things. It was like, there was, there may have been like an amanuensis, which is like a fancy word for like a secretary, um, that helped compile this, this text for mm-hmm. Paul, or this one may have been written pseudonymously under, yeah. you know, yeah. and what does that mean? Um, do right. we, you know, and so like I would. I was thrown I'm sorry, what does pseudonymously mean? Pseudonymous, pseudo, under, under a pseudonym. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Just under, for the people I'm, who don't know. Sure, they're out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <coughs> so all those different, all those different things just, just like made everything feel way uncertain. And I, you know, the thing about fundamentalism is it's supposed to make you feel certain. Hmm. Um, right, 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 right. I just don't know. That's you an don't know how to way cope to put with that, that yeah. certainty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, for you're sure. Not, you're not you're not equipped in any at any point to deal with uncertainty because doubt is in many ways discouraged. Yep. Mm. Um so that that sort of was my very first steps into deconstruction and 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 really dealing with things mm-hmm. in that way. So you're not one of those assholes where like something really bad happened to you and then you left the church after it. 
because that, that's kind of what I am, I guess. You know, <laughs> that's what most of our. But, most but of our you're guests more are. of like yours was kind of like more of an intellectual thing that, but also I hear well, you speaking that it had to do with like empathy too of like caring about others and seeing how that treatment is happening to others, not necessarily right. something that directly happened to you. And I, I think that's hella respectful. I like that. Yeah. I yeah, like empathetic I mean, people. Other, other bad, other bad shit happened. I mean, gotcha. there are, yeah, <clears throat> there, there are things that, that like later on, you know, I, um, to sort of cliff notes, some things like, you know, I disengage from, I, I just, have to distance after, after I graduate, like I just sort of have to distance myself from the questions of, of God. Um, and that's one, that's one other thing that, that personally I'm sort of coming back to right now is that, that like evangelicalism equips you to, to ask the question of God, even when you're not interested in asking the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and even when you already sort of have your answer, uh, or whatever, you just, you just keep asking the question. And it's it's sort of bothersome, um, and so it was sort of like I disengaged. Uh, I got married a couple of years after college, which you know I was married by the time I was twenty three. You know that's very common. Um, yep, I was too. And my wife and I, we 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 like dabbled in different churches. We ended up at this church that our friends were going to, um, which we ended up really. It was one of those things where you end up like really loving the people, mm -hmm. and you stomach some you stomach the stuff you disagree with right um, right 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 uh yeah and so we were there for several years um and then that came to a head when my daughter was two um and like again i mentioned earlier like uh i've never i was always egalitarian because it never was never an issue for me yeah we approached the we approached the leadership there and said you know, in, like, like in this one-on-one -on -one meeting, basically, you know, we, that, you know, we're egalitarian. We know you're complementarian. Um, but meaning like, this, the gen, like gender role, like strict gender roles. Right. right. Yeah. And like leadership in the church and all this stuff. As opposed and, to women playing an equal role and, and right. having the same, you know, rights and yeah. Yeah. We had been at this church for five or six years. I mean, this was an investment. Yeah. They, oh, that's they, a long they, time. They basically said uh, their initial response was, "Yeah, some people say this, and yeah, you can leave." Um, wow! Even though we'd 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 put so much time, you know, we hosted the small groups, we did all these things, and yeah, um, all this stuff, and like, it, it, I never hid the fact that I was more liberal than most of them, you know, but it right. was, um, it was still it. A few months later, like they were, they had agreed to have these conversations with us and have these other couples sort of mediate things. And then, um, my, my, uh, my wife who just knows her stuff, you know, she sort of put the pastor on the spot about, you know, his sort of clobber verses in regards to, um, you know, women in the church and, and put him in his place basically <laughs> cool. uh, clobber verses. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a term that people usually use with like Romans one twenty six and Leviticus 17 about being gay and all sure. that shit. But, clobber verses. Um, but it's the ones that, that like, you know, sexist and homophobes use. <laughs> it's clobber basically. time. Um, so anyways, they, they sort of called it off and like the pastor said, uh, I feel persecuted or whatever. Oh, and, Lord. Uh, it's like, you have all the power. You don't, there are no other elders in the church besides you. Um, because whatever. And, and eventually we, we had to leave. Um, so we weren't like forced out, but it was not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we left and then that was, one of the hard things because we lost, we lost like our, our local sort of social support network. Like, yeah. um, you know, Chicago is a, a pretty big city. Like we moved to the neighborhood we're in because of this, because our friends, you know, were in this church and, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, we don't have friends in the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, and then we were, you know, holy ghosted like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love that. That's really good. That, that is not my term. That is a term that, uh, I, I, I saw in some, <laughs> 
uh, Atheist blog or something. Oh uh, my god, that's so good though. But it's, I mean, you know exactly what it is. Oh right yeah, away. absolutely. I mean, so it's uh, so that that was my final sort of thing in yeah. uh, the last in evangelicalism. I'm probably a little different than most of your guests because in an unexpected way, I like starting in 2016 started attending an Episcopal church, uh-huh. um, which was. Wait, did not we, something that, did we that? know this before we got him on the show? Yeah, I don't know. Sorry, we need to cut off to the cut, interview. We're gonna have to. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I can, I can be, you know, I yeah. So, so anyways, <laughs> that was, uh, we're just kidding. Um, that was that was also this sort of unexpected turn uh, mm-hmm. as far as my relationship with like institutional churches, um, but ended up being it was because of the sort of we lucked into a really great place in that, you know, it was, it, it's a church that is overseen by a, 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 a queer woman. Um, and she's accepted as the leader in that church and is an, um, the f- best pastor. <laughs> yeah. Just, just the best. Yeah. Um, and is a wonderful person that in and of itself has been a sort of healing that, that we didn't expect. It's, it I, serves I, you. It doesn't, it's not, I mean, the thing about evangelicalism is that it's like pretty inherently self-serving for the most part. Like it, even, even when it tries to be serving, like, uh, like serving other people, it's, it's ultimate goal is to, to self-sustain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Self-preserve. Right. Oh, absolutely. That's a whereas, very good point. whereas this is an experience where you're actually, you Thriving. actually feel, yeah, mm-hmm. you, you feel like you can be yourself and you, you can, you can grow and you can, right. yeah, for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't really like we. What we do with our show is encourage people to get away from toxicity. We don't really give a fuck what you do after that, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, that's, just yeah. don't wander back into another toxic environment. And and right. that's one of the worst things I've watched a documentary. Um, oh, holy hell, I've mentioned a couple times on the show. Uh, I think it was Holy Hell, but at the end, it was either that or the one called The Family. Okay. And at the end, it did a follow up of a lot of the cult survivors, and then showed a lot of them have gone on to other cults. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, damn, you know, don't yeah. fall into this. Don't return to your vomit. Right. And uh, I don't know. I, I, that's what I appreciate about your show and what we're trying to do here is kind of getting there, hitting a wall, and then going back and saying, hey, don't keep going this direction. You're just going to run into a wall. Right. Let's try a different direction together. Uh, so yeah. I appreciate yeah, that you I do would- that. Yeah, I love I love that sort of metaphor of hitting a wall, you know, just because that's that's very true. I think a, a lot of, you know, a lot of most people's experience within evangelicalism is eventually it starts to become really constrictive unless you're mm. a very particular type of person, you know, and that type of person is like not even Ned Flanders, like Ned Flanders is probably sure. too out there now. <laughs> you know? you're right, right, like, right. Yeah, 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 but, you're right. I mean, cause, that's um, be you know be because you have to be like straight and he, white and, he like used to be like, hyperbolic but now he's just kind of like oh yeah right guy. yeah he's kind of yeah. sexy too have you seen him take off his shirt before yeah sexy he's flanders ri- he's ripped he is ripped. ripped and we do need a, to take a yeah. break actually <laughs> um hey, yeah we apparently I'm sorry, Blake, I, I, before I've we been, i've been chatting a lot so oh, you're fine no I'm well not. you're our guest you know <laughs> um later on you know we're not done with the interview obviously but at the end of the interview can we share some bookstore some christian bookstore stories oh absolutely Books, yes book stories if yes. you will yeah i've got some stories i've got some good ones man back blake um so we have heard about your deconstruction what kind of got you there when did you start making a podcast what was your what was your like little journey of like oh i should sure. let people hear my beautiful voice and speak to people <laughs> oh well thank you for that compliment oh, you're welcome. um that so it started sort of I don't know, I I guess organically in that, that after I had this experience that I, that I just talked about with this really bad experience leaving a church, 
I had started messaging with a friend of mine that I knew from college and had mentioned he, he's been on my show a few times. His name's Stephen Jones. He does mm-hmm. uh, a show actually now with another friend from college, Seth Harshman. Um, their show is called the E9 Podcast. It's about Enneagram stuff if you're into that. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard good things. Which, Yeah. You're either really into it or you're not. There's really no in between. Yeah, the Enneagram it's stuff. true. So I was sort of talking with him uh, just over like Facebook Messenger uh, saying – you know, we have all these, there's all these people like the two of us that, that went to this college and are so very different now, very different than sort of where we were, uh, as impressionable young teens and 20 year olds. And there's something there, like just exploring why a podcast that ex- sort of explored why people decided to leave evangelicalism because it's such a prescribed way of life and to leave it like it does have an effect on you. It does require a changing in the way you think it changed and your social circle because evangelicalism is so insular. Like if you choose to leave, most people won't come with you. You know, most people like most people won't watch you go. Some people won't associate with you in light of that. It was like, okay, what if I did a show about this and just, the podcast format seems to be better than than a blog or something else because who is going to read three thousand words on this? Yeah, yeah, sixteen. Mm-hmm. You know, For sure. um, and the the podcast format just allows people to tell in their own words and their own voice their experience and really just let it be this sort of show that artic- lets people articulate what it what it was that made them separate from this sort mm-hmm. of movement. Um, and so I sort of landed on the the term exvangelical because it was sort of quippy and punny, just sort of in in a quick little in a quick little soundbite or what have you. Um, it's a quick moniker that if you have the that experience and you recognize it sort of right away. And that was really the sort of starting point. Um, and for me, a lot of it was really sort of a cathartic sort of intent. Like yeah. I wanted to sort of work this out. I wanted to talk to the the people that I that I knew. I just wanted to start with my friends. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I mean, like, that's li- that's exactly how our show started. It was just mm-hmm. like, right. man, I got all these feelings about this experience, and I have nowhere to put them. But I know these people have also had it, so let's just like right. talk it out. Let's right. Talk it out. Yeah. 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 And there's something really fucking therapeutic about it. It is. <laughs> there is yeah, yeah. You're right. And so that was really the start. I I did study like evangelical politics. Um I I worked full time and got my master's part time. Okay. And I and my my master's degree I studied uh the sort of creation care what which I mentioned earlier mm-hmm. and ev- evangelical politics. Mm-hmm. Um so and, that and was, how those how those sort of intersected. And that's only like become a worthwhile issue to study since what like 1999 give or take 98 something like that which i mean it it started uh, evangelical politics i mean obviously they started way before that but like it's only been relevant to the public eye since you know like late clinton era yeah yeah so so i mean a lot of a lot of the the pieces that have broken out into the the broader um public were in that area in that era Hmm. for sure like late 90s and that sort of thing um so, so yeah, so I, because of my interest in evangelical politics, because of my experience at Christian college, my studying it later, mm-hmm. um, I, I released the first episode the week of the Republican National Convention in nice. 2016. Good move. Good move. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so More time. just because, uh, just because it felt appropriate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but that was what year? 2016 2016 so, okay oh, okay so yeah. the the most interesting and chaotic rnc to right. ever happen ever <laughs> yeah and if you and if you listen to the episode i did with my friend john um who is who is an american religious historian that's what he went to school for and everything <coughs> and we we were totally wrong you know we we were like in that conversation we we're like trump there's no way you know, there's no right, right. way evangelicals are going to support this 
immoral asshole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little did we know that they'd be his biggest cheerleaders. Like, yeah, yeah. We should have. We should have seen it. Coming, we should have seen you know? it coming, but we. I couldn't. I couldn't see it either. And it's like I was. I mean, I was. Ra- I was homeschooled, and I was raised in that environment that was like we need to create political machines. Like we are raising the future senators of America, and it's because right. we need to outlaw abortion. And I. It's like I should have seen it coming because Trump just like. All all evangelicals need is 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 uh, talk. All they need is just that front. They don't mm. need any more right. substance. They just need people to say what they want them to say. Right, and that's why that's why ab- abortion has been the the carrot that they've dangled in front of them for so long. Yeah, you know, like Republicans. Yeah, they yeah, be yeah. Republicans. You know, like like there hasn't been any up and up until the last ten or twenty years when state level stuff has gotten really nasty yeah. and like removing um restricting abortion access and everything yeah. at that level um but at the national level i mean that was all just for show yeah now absolutely it's, now, now it's, it's becoming now, serious now business. that evangelicals are like actually in power yeah now it's really serious yeah yeah and, and it's it's strange I, because it's this last ditch effort before the whole movement just vanishes you know in the next like 15 years so that's, uh, fingers least, crossed yeah fingers <laughs> crossed i mean yeah i, I don't, I don't yeah. see it lasting much yeah longer. Oh, so your your show is kind of it's it's kind of blown up since i mean you've been doing it uh the, but you know over over two years what like two and a half years now give or take um you have uh what are your you have your private facebook group has about the th- th- 3500 members now give or take yeah yeah we're uh, i think after the sort of bump from cbs we were oh, at yeah. around 3700 cool. now cool cool, cool. But, i mean yeah like we oh, over we went from like 70 members last summer to you know over three thousand and a little over a year, and a and year, year and a that's, half. That's wild. That's really crazy. That's yeah, awesome. That yeah. exponential growth. Uh, and and you've picked up some pretty cool, uh, some pretty good influencers along the way. You got uh, Chris, Chris Stroop. Stroop, Chris Stroop, who has been on our show, who's just mm-hmm. a, a brilliant political mind. Um, uh, so you have this, you have this kind of like, uh. I feel like kind of a network of, of like our show of um, of you know several like Corey Pig's show um, the failed missionary. missionary. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there there I could probably list off like five shows that have sort of like ex evangelical sort of been like a fulcrum for everybody to sort of meet each other. If mm-hmm. you if if that's not too complimentarian, um, it's pretty cool. <laughs> like we're almost we're almost forming right. this this network and and there's this growth and. Um, yeah, and that is that's resulted in some cool exposure for you. So recently, you were featured, uh, you and you and um, you're Blake, you, Chris <laughs> you and Chris, you and Chris Stroop were featured on a CBS special about exvangelicalism, if you will, if if that can be an ism. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. So so talk about that. How'd that how'd that come about? How did how'd it go? How do you feel about it? I, I feel overall, I feel good about it. I mean, it, it's still sort of, we're recording this just a few days after it, after it aired. I was sort of, sort of flabbergasted to sort of watch it. Um, it's, it was a lot to sort of process that it, that it actually you know, came about and, and was, they considered it valuable for their, uh, you know, to, to cover and, and worthy of covering and which is in a lot of ways really flattering because again I mentioned like the show started as a as a way of sort of exploring what it what it meant for me and for for my friends and the people that I knew to to move away from uh, to move away personally from evangelicalism and for it to find that sort of resonance uh, in a wider audience has been really really surprising and and really humbling that came about really through one of through some of some of the connections that that Chris had had in regards to in regards to his academic work for up until recently he was uh, teaching at a university in Florida uh, and he knew another uh, academic in Florida Julie Ingersoll who was also fe- featured in okay yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I like and so they, she's great she's awesome yeah she's she's she is phenomenal and she has a she has a book uh, about Christian reconstructionism actually. Mm-hmm called building god's kingdom which is really good yeah um very insightful into that movement and actually she'd written a book 
um, that is on my list. I haven't um, gotten to that one yet, um, but she wrote a book several years ago that was actually explicitly about evangelical women's experience in evangelicalism and the struggles they face. So they they sort of started talking and working with uh, with Liz, and then one of the ways in which we we thought to really disseminate things prior to it to the special going live and as a sort of umbrella was to use the evangelical podcast and have um, and have a live event in in mm-hmm. Clearwater. So that's when we had the first first live event um, and brought together a handful of people that were primarily in that area. I was one of the one of the one of the only ones that that came outside of Florida to talk about things relative to uh, evangelical subculture. So I sort of framed things up, but then we then we let each person talk about something specific to their experience. So um, Catherine Brightbill spoke really eloquently about um, her home homeschool experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris talked about his experience in Christian schools and mm-hmm. his work. Um, David Wheeler was a professor at Asbury, and one of the interesting things about him is that he's actually one of the few uh, professors that didn't have to sign an NDA, because uh, oh, okay. that's actually something that a lot of Christian colleges employ to silence ah, people. Interesting. Um, and so he spoke a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. Um, Akiko uh, Ross talked about her experience as a woman and a woman of color mm-hmm. in uh, Southern Baptist tradition mm. and Julie Angersall shared her insights about about evangelicalism and, and different aspects of things. And it was a great event. Um, and it's been really cool to see people uh, respond to the special and and learn about learn about what's been happening sort of organically for the last two re- two years um, that's played out primarily like on Twitter and Facebook. Sure. Um, and to to see it to have a new avenue for those sort of ideas to to go out there and for the critiques that evangelical voices have are just really really valuable and I, yeah, I mean yeah I believe that inherently <laughs> I kind of feel like no absolutely I I 100% like it, like it's like when we started this podcast it didn't occur to me that this w- like that we were joining a really important political movement of people that are capable of explaining evangelicalism to the yeah. rest of the world right, right. um you know like right. which is a re- which is really important for you know uh, liberals to understand it, like like why Donald Trump became the president and what it has to do with with evangelicalism and what we can do as a culture, as a movement to like, to counter that, to prevent it, to educate, to, you know, to encourage, I mean, like, I, like hashtag empty, the, empty the pews. Like, uh, you know, Chris has said that one of the few things that evangelicals are threatened by is, is lower hashtags, church numbers. Um. Yeah. Hashtag empty the pews. Yes. Hashtags. Yeah. No, is, is less is less people attending church. So it's like the, we can take these steps to, to, to disempower the evangelical movement, which really represents, you know, 25, 30% of, I think only of the Republican vote, not even of the electorate as a whole. Right. Right. Uh, Yeah. That was, that was an interesting thing that Diana Butler Bass shared on, on her, Twitter, like after the midterms was that I I think she actually was quoting someone else. The statistic was, was that even though evangelicals as percentage of the general population has declined over time, they have remained consistent in representation electorally at 25%. Yeah. Um, which is, which is disheartening. Um, (laughs) right. Yes. Well, and I mean, it's just something that, that we need to be able to respond to. Mm -hmm. And I think that Evan, like to like evangelical voices, they definitely have political value. And I think that, that there is a sort of inherent, um, political critique that happens Mm, um, when someone uses that, uh, uses that term. And it's not something that I consider necessarily mandatory. If someone, the term itself, it, it really signifies that you, have this past experience just but that you no longer associate with it just similar to like you ever you had a relationship you know your ex-husband or ex-wife or ex-girlfriend or whatever Mm -hmm. 
it signifies that that there's that there's this relationship in the past that did have an impact on you, mm-hmm. but doesn't necessarily determine your future, right, I like that, um, yeah. or your present. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so, to me, that's one of the things about it is that that it can help signify that you had this experience and you can speak to it with personal knowledge as well as this ability to to give a more nuanced critique because mm. that i think that's the one thing about when when the broader culture sort of tries to respond to evangelicalism words literally don't mean the same thing like certain words right, don't right. don't have the same meaning within evangelicalism that they do. So when an evangelical says them, oh, someone else might say, oh, okay, yeah, I get that. But but they're actually saying something different. Right, 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 yeah. That is interesting because uh, we are kind of, we are in a unique place to be kind of a translator for that. Yeah, um, right. yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's, that's that's actually Chris's new hashtag, right? His most recent hashtag is... Uh, oh, God, yes. Is, uh, what is it? Uh, How, um, English, evangel- I think. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Oh my god! What yeah, is it? Say that, it again. That was evangelical, evangelical to English. Evangelical to English. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. right. And so, yeah. I think that one was um, was started by I think Bethany Sparkle. Okay, uh, he, I know. I know he he attributes it to her in uh, in his blog post about it. And I'm I may have uh, I I may have butchered her her Twitter username, but. <laughs> That's what I, I know. Uh, but it's anyways, um, but it was Bethany and and Chris sort of working together on that, and and yeah, that's exactly right. Like evangelical in the English is is like and being able to translate those things, and I also think that that the other thing that's implicit in people using the term evangelical is that I think there is a power in in folks visibly disassociating um, mm. with evangelicalism yeah. because it, it helps to serve that purpose of one signaling to other folks that are still within evangelicalism that might have their own doubts yeah Mm -hmm. uh, that like you're not alone it's not you're not crazy people have gone through this going back to that sort of general social critique like that that this is not evangelicalism is not a healthy way of life yeah 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 yeah. Um, yeah Today, today, I, just today, I, I I tweeted that um, little did we know that evangelicalism was the alternative lifestyle all along. <laughs> like, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. That's um, awesome. You know, just because I mean, it's just whatever we can do uh, as a group, as individuals, to highlight the things that are problematic within evangelicalism. I think is a benefit both to the broader public. Uh, in educating them to the things that happen within evangelicalism, as well as to one another and mm-hmm. those those folks that need some solidarity and like the work that you that that you do on your show as far as making space for people, mm-hmm. I think that is a huge huge thing that you just need. Sometimes people just need a tiny bit of permission. You know, talk right. about self exploration earlier. Right. You know, they yeah. just need that Damn. little bit of permission. Yeah. Well, you know? Chris even said in the CBS special uh, a phrase that we use a lot here, and is that I thought I was the only one going through yeah. X or yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. it is. And, right. And you stop and think and about it. And most of us did at one point, you know. Yeah. Uh, and if you think about it, though, beforehand, with my very fundamentalist background, when somebody left our church, they just disappeared. Yeah. They were no longer yeah, yeah, part yeah. of my life. We right. only ghosted them. We wouldn't talk to them. We didn't really, <laughs> we'd even cut them on Facebook um, yeah. if that, when that was a thing or MySpace or Zanga. Oh yeah, Zanga. But um, really before <laughs> that, there is not an opportunity <laughs> or a medium to listen to people's stories that left the church. Yeah. They just disappeared. They they were nothing. And so right. I love now that we have these mediums and especially ones like podcasts that if somebody is still in a even a marriage or a relationship or they're going to church, they can just slip their headphones on and go into the bathroom <laughs> or whatever. And Instead of hear. listening to the football game, they can listen to our podcast. Yeah, and I think that's like or Blake's. It's an honor, I feel like. Um and Blake um <coughs> I know you feel the same way. I just, I feel it's an honor for us to be able to speak into people's ears and to kind of like share our stories and other stories that uh, right. normally we wouldn't have any exposure to. Right. Absolutely. And it's, I mean, I consider that a, a huge honor and like people that read that, 
that message me, that reach out to me, um, and share that sort of share that sort of thing of thinking that that they were alone or you know mm. whatever that because that's the thing is that um, you're actively discouraged from sharing your questions yes. in a place in so many evangelical spaces, and I don't think that it's just the fundamentalist ones. You know, that's the thing is that that there is so much even in you know, so-called like regular churches or, or whatever that can be really, really damaging, really discouraging. And uh, that can lead to abuse that can mm. lead to trauma, like all of these things that, um, are not easily discountable when you, when you actually talk to, to people, talk to people like, like, like we, we all do, you know, and let them tell their stories and, and I think there's something super cathartic about about exactly what you said, Brady. Putting on headphones, hearing someone's voice, hmm. and knowing that there was someone else that has been through something similar. Hmm. Especially if it's something like a you know, I as a as a white guy, like you know, this world was built for me, and if it's going to you know reject me for some like somewhat liberal ideas it's so much worse <laughs> for so many people yeah mm. if they're if there are you know women are automatically just in so many spaces just mm -hmm. put down on a lower peg yes. mm -hmm. if you if you are a person of color uh if mm -hmm. you're queer mm -hmm. like all of those things you know your impact is just the the trauma that that you are potentially exposed to is exponentially worse yeah if there's anything i can do to abdicate the privilege that i have it's by like centering those voices that were not centered mm. in those spaces mm. um and yeah. that's that is what i seek to do that's great fucking that's fucking that. yeah no that's great i look at an analogy of like a pioneer <clears throat> of that you know they were they have to clear of land and they have to start building and then they create a civilization and it feels like if we don't communicate to each other we're just making people go and clearing the land over and over and over and over but whenever we communicate like this and share these stories then we kind of already have a little bit of that pathway built for people mm. you know some of yeah. those weeds have already been hacked away and yeah, added yeah, down yeah. right and and uh, I think the more that we hear that, um, the more we could pave something and actually create yeah. A, yeah. like a, a village. It's like all, a village. It, all of these little podcasts and blogs and books are just, they're all little little paths. And the more paths there are, the more easier it is for people to find their way out. Right? Um, before right. we go on our break, I want everybody to know that uh, Chuck just did John Piper hands. We'll be right back <laughs> right after this. If you were going to die tonight, do you know where Stop. you- Stop. Just tell them about our website. Oh, just tell them to go to thelifeafter.org? Yes, they can go now, even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> thelifeafter.org. We have a blog, contact page, a link to our Facebook page, and more. All right, thelifeafter.org. Heavenly. Well, Ready to... Welcome back to... <laughs> Welcome back to the life after. I'm Brady Hardin. And We're this very is Chuck professional. Parson. I'm very professional. Um, this, Blake, what's next for evangelical? For zoo, boy, rough. What's next for evangelical? Uh, well, I'm gonna continue doing the main show, uh, which is really focused, similar to yours, on personal narrative sort of stories. Yeah, talking about just just folks. Um, uh, really just their experiences with an evangelicalism and, and afterwards and, and honestly very, very similar to, to your show. We, we do a lot, a lot of similar work and, um, so I'll continue to highlight those stories. And we, sometimes we steal ripped our guests. Yeah, you like, steal our guests. To rip, you, we ripped off your show. We, okay, let's get this out in the open, all right? <laughs> so we didn't no, know no, your show existed, but we did rip it off. But then you started ripping off our guest. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, but we like, started oh, ripping off Jamie, his guest. Jamie Lee Finchon. Hey, he, <laughs> And then who else did you pulch from us? I'm just kidding. Everybody else he had first. So that's we double, literally we double the only dipped one. too. Yeah. We, anyway, so are you are you yeah. um, are you thinking about continuing with the the live thing? Did that go Did that go well? Are you feeling confident about yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. It, it was it was good. Um. So I think it'll be an uh, interesting 
to to do that in the future. One of the things that that we're hoping to do is to have a uh, a larger event in summer next year in 2019. Cool. Very cool. Uh, that would be more really just just a, a, a larger show, uh, and that in, involves a lot more planning and and that sort of thing. So I don't have much to talk about sort of publicly at this point. Sure. But that is what we're what. But um, you are currently working on it. Yes. So so it's are. gonna it's it's yeah. It, yeah. So it, the wheels are turning, yeah. and you know what? Right now, it, it's still sort of early stages. Just to give you a sort of sense, I mean, we're we're trying to lock down a venue so that we have a sense of scale. Sure. Um, and then we'll be working on uh on, and we're also sort of planning out what sort of things to feature and 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 who else we can highlight and and have to the show and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um. Well, if so you need two handsome podcast guests to come visit, absolutely. you know, I, you know <laughs> I, I definitely want to include sort of a podcast stage, um, and I would, you know, it would be awesome to have you, have both of you there. Oh, um, there it is. That's well, all we needed. That's but, what yeah. we were here right, for. Cool. Right, uh, we'll we'll send right, us over night. the paperwork. Thanks. We'll <laughs> sign it. Uh, you all have a good night. If uh, you don't go to church Saturday, uh, Sunday, 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 Sunday. Bye. Yeah. Or Sunday, 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 Sunday. So, um. So yeah, in that regard, um, uh, that the, the live events were, were good. Um, excuse me. And the one in September in Florida was interesting in that it was, it, it sort of modeled like, like an academic sort of seminar or something. Mm. Um, so, you know, we had folks give these sort of short, short talks and then had the panel respond to a handful of questions. Um, the next event that, that we had in October, which was really great was, a book reading uh, featuring Josiah Hessa and a couple of uh, other of his tour mates that he actually went throughout the fall to different parts of the the country and did readings from his book, The Carnality Series. Um, and which, he was in the SCBS special too, wasn't he? Yes. Okay, yeah. okay, I remember him. Some of the uh, the footage from that did not make it, did not make it into the show itself, mm-hmm. um, but. There is a whole episode uh, of the podcast uh, devoted to that, uh, and that featured Josiah and sort of an interview that I had with him along with Chris Stroop uh, about his work, which his work was about. Um, he he has a book series planned that really sort of dives into evangelicalism, um, sort of a lot of one a lot of like rapture anxiety sort of thing, mm-hmm. um, you know, dealing with sort of growing up in in two cultures really even just here in the states like of like being an evangelical culture and then trying to understand the overall popular culture it's just a really really fascinating novels um cool. and he like if you guys haven't connected with him definitely look him up um he's We're great on it. and it's another guest we can poach what was his name again <laughs> josiah josiah hesse <clears throat> He's based in Denver. It's been good to have those sort of events that get people uh, in in the same physical space because there, I mean, there is something to that. Uh, Mm -hmm. And for as much as this has been this phenomenal thing, this phenomenal community that's existed online, it's one one of the things that I'd I'd love to do in the coming year and moving forward is is really plugging in and, and meeting people you know, in, in the real world. Uh, Isn't that cool? We've done that a couple of times. Like we had, uh, the Derek Webb show mm-hmm. at your house. Yeah, yeah. And then we also uh, had like a, uh, uh, the party for the yeah. end of season one. Yeah, yeah. And it's been cool to like meet guests in real life. Yeah. And, and actually like, oh, yeah. uh, we had a, we had a listener who was in from Texas and was able to come in, uh, meet an Angie and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. It's been really cool. I uh, was just able to meet Chris for the first time in person. Oh yeah, at, in September. Yeah, you oh, know, wow. filming that. Uh, so, yeah. so you know, like, uh, so there's a, a a real power in in meetups and that sort of thing, and yeah. so we're gonna try to facilitate that more. And I I do hope that w- the other thing that in in addition to that it, to these live events is also. Um, uh, I'm hoping to, you know, get a producer so I can do just more interviews and not focus on the editing because this oh, is yeah. just a, a one-man sort of show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I feel you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> so so we're so I'm gonna try to do that so that I can do just more research and interviews. Yeah, and then sure. um also do uh devote more time towards uh uh doing some more writing and and that sort of thing as well. Very cool. Um, I'm looking so, forward to that. Yeah, it's it's been it's been really cool and again since I'm sort of a one man show, like my production level hasn't always been what I wanted it to be this year. Yeah. I'm hoping to make that more regular and, and all that sort of stuff. You know, it's, I'm feeling very positive about things here at the end of 2018. Cool. So. Beautiful. Okay. So, so, it's a book so stories. everybody here, everybody here at some point in their life for some amount of time worked mm. at a Christian bookstore. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> solidarity, maybe much to our audience surprise. Christian bookstores are full of weird shit. Mm-hmm. There is a that is a, they are weird places um, where weird cultural things happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna we're gonna swap a, swap a couple of stories here. So uh, Chuck, the bookstore that you were at, you were at Lifeway, Lifeway we Christian say that Bookstore, online. which I might say I'll bleep it out. Basically, <laughs> is <laughs> is Christian bookstores? I mean, are there any other ones? What, why I was an independent. I'm just kidding. There's was family an, Christian bookstores. I was an independent one. Yeah, no, family Christian folded. They're oh, gone. Oh, they're gone. Okay. Oh, that's right. Life, I remember reading Lifeway that finally. Uh, yeah. So they so, vanquished them. So family is MySpace and Lifeway is Facebook. That just makes sense. <laughs> I was at I was at one that's no longer open anymore called One Way Bookshops. There was like One 11, Way. I remember those. Eleven of us in the St. Louis area. So you were like more. You were probably a thirty minute drive from where I was, or forty minute drive. Yeah, I was from in North bookstore. County. You were in yeah. Okay. So I was at, I was at one called Lemstone Books, which was like a smaller regional franchise. Uh-huh. Okay. Of, uh okay. Yeah, I think for whatever reason, in in my part of the Midwest, um, yeah, and it it was in a mall um instead of its own building uh-huh. so instead of being closed we, on Sundays, we got to we got to close we got to open an hour later you know an hour later on Sunday, so you could go to church yeah 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 that's hilarious <laughs> do you guys uh just we were from... closed on sunday because we were a real christian bookstore <laughs> that's right yeah that's true just like chick-fil-a yes so you know what? Let's do this. Um, I'm going to name a secular band, and I need you guys to suggest a Christian okay, alternative for me. Go for okay. It. <laughs> uh, okay. Limpus get uh, Pod. Blake. Very good. I I agree with that. Okay. Um, pillar. Oh, pillar. I oh, mean, oh, that's I, an answer. That's another one. I just wanted to throw it out there. Thousand okay. foot crutch. Oh God! I can keep going. Um, <laughs> well, let's see here. The Civil Wars. Um, Joy Williams, who was in the Civil War. There we go. Blake, <laughs> that's a good. I don't know that band. I'm I'm showing my. <laughs> that's okay. Basic. Uh, Christina whatever. Aguilera. Uh, Stacy Orico. Stacy Orico. Stacy Orico. That was like she came to my store. Did she? Did she? I. She we used like, to have a sticker of her face on a broom, and it. That's my memory of her. That's it. <laughs> It, there was a tiny sticker of her face on the store broom. Through my church, I knew a guy that was really good friends with her and took her to homecoming. <laughs> no so I'm way. like, yeah, I'm like Whoa. two degrees from Stacey Rico. Nice. Um, That's awesome. I guess she's still a thing. I don't think Is so. She, I, I think she's verified on Twitter. She's around. Oh, no joke. Wow. Stone Temple Pilots. Oh, that's a hard one. Uh, then, oh, man. Uh, Ew. <sighs> Striper? No, no, really. they were like a metal band. Petra, they? yeah, no, Petra was kind of heavy too. They were kind of like small town poetsies, weren't they? Like a little small bit. Ta- yeah, the other one I was like going to rock say, alternative. I, uh, maybe the Normals. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I don't remember mm-hmm. that. They've got that sort of indie vibe. Yeah. Uh, mm. Well, I mean, Stone Temple Pilots, Pilots weren't envy, indie; they were alternative, I guess. What um, Bible translation did you guys try to like trick people into buying? I did ESV, like, duh. Yeah, I did ESV and NSAB because they were more word for word translations. Yeah, those were word for word. You into that? You wanted word for word? I like with your mysticism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was way before mysticism. Oh, okay, bro. okay, okay. This was way yeah. before that. What Bible would, translation would a mystic prefer? Um, probably the NLT, maybe. 
No, oh, Mystic, dynamic, no. dynamic translation. I kind of yeah. like the NLT. To Mystics be, don't really teenage. care about translations. They don't. They, they too, be a thing they care it's getting about. too nuanced. About, but about the the hmm. Amplified Bible, where it just gives you like fourteen adjectives. Right, 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 right. Yeah, the Amplified Bible is like <laughs> a thesaurus who fucked a, a NIV. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. <laughs> fucked uh, had I, sex with, reproduced um, with. Did you ever get people that asked for concordances? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Not yeah. concordances. Concor- concordances. Concordances. That's probably how I would have pronounced it because you know I mispronounce some things. Occasionally. Yeah. Occasionally, all the time, pretty often, and probably right now. That was the amplified <laughs> yeah, version. It's right now. Right. I now. don't know what you said. <laughs> um, give me one more band. Oh, um, I'm talking to the microphone. I am. Dad, <laughs> I'm talking into the mic. Um, <laughs> Barbara Streisand. <laughs> there's no there's no oh, sandy, patty. Oh, sandy, sandy patty oh sandy patty that's a good, sure. yeah, that's beautiful a good one beautiful feet yeah beautiful feet god makes beautiful feet is that, that a was song? a that was a duet that she sang with gerbert the the, the puppet <laughs> and they also on the same album they had um a couple of other songs that I'm trying to remember, but it was always like Sandy Patty singing with Gerbert. It was a very like Sherry Lewis. No, what is her name? And um, that that lamb, lamb oh, chop. Oh, lamb chops play along. It was very much like that. Okay. But my Weird. grandma, she she had this old like Volkswagen car. No, like an Oldsmobile. I mean, and that was the only cassette tape that that we would play whenever I was there. So that was like a Sandy Patty, Sandy Patty and Gerbert, oh like their God. duet CD <laughs> or their cassette tape. Uh, so like the smell of her car and that cassette tape, everything like always brings back like a lot of memories. So did did any of you guys have any like particularly strange characters that? that made their way into your bookstore. Well, we had the one. That's, this is what I, this is the meat for me. This is like, cause we would get weird people. Well, we, we had the conversation where we found out we had the same guy come in who yeah. compulsively picked up books and Bibles, shook them by the Did we talk about put, that on the show? Uh, cause I, I think we did. Early I don't remember on. if we it did. It might've actually so there, been the first episode. There that was we this scrapped. gentleman. I think it was on that and we scrapped it. So yeah. there, there was this gentleman in the St. Louis Metro area. Yeah. Like, <laughs> who? Oh Opposite sides of the city here. Happened to, you know, not to shame anybody, right? No, he is, yeah, there was ha- something. Have a leather fetish of some sort. Mm-hmm. And uh, he would come in not to... Not the ones I'm familiar with, but a different type I of re- leather fetish. We, like, we <laughs> knew this man, you know, the second he walked in the door, unless you were new, it was like, oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> and he would, so Brady has a little bit more interesting story, but for me, like, my experience with him is that he would come in, he would go straight to the Bible aisle, and he would pick up genuine leather bibles and he would sort of like flap them around yeah like he would like shake them around Mm -hmm. and like put them back in the box for the listeners please explain that genuine leather is top shelf bible yeah this is these are like (laughs) this is not your bonded minimum this is no bonded leather bullshit bullshit. minimum 80 (laughs) dollars for a bonded leather bible if you had genuine leather is yeah yeah the well, younger is, the dead animal the better oh it keeps going because if you i mean if you had indices that was another ten dollars so you're looking at somewhere between an 80 and 110 dollar bible mm-hmm. but 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 <laughs> you you guess tracking you could special order lambs or uh v like like uh veal skin yeah veal skin mm-hmm. like super super soft baby cow skin leather Mm -hmm. bibles and these things were like even i was a little bit into them you know like i no i'm just kidding yeah yes but no (laughs) but i mean they were really nice and these started at like 130 dollars i think and if you got a bigger one it's like 140 but at lifeway they had to be special ordered because we couldn't just have them on the shelf right Mm -hmm. so this gentleman would come in and he would ask about these veal leather bibles and he would special order them all the time but he could only actually afford them like a quarter of the time so we were obligated to order bibles for him and that so we would get them in he wouldn't buy them the 30 days would pass and then we would have to put them on the shelf so we would have like sometimes two hundred dollar bibles sitting on our shelf oh my goodness and then he would waltz in and just play with them (laughs) Like shake them around. That's so this weird. Guy. God, what in the world? But I remember, like, 
<laughs> you know, you and I, we were talking about working at Christian bookstores. I started telling a story and we realized, oh, that's the same guy that came to mind, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. What about you, Blake? Did he come all the way up to Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think I got that, that, that guy. We had this huge, like special art section, which was just Thomas Kincaid shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had the that master s- of light. Like, we had that section. Yeah. We had that section. Yeah. So we, we had this massive section and like, it was, it was, I don't know. It was like the store owner's pride and joy or something. And, but that shit would not move because it'd be like $350 yeah, for yeah, yeah. like yet another, yet another painting of that, that cottage. Cottage, yeah. Scene, you know, then like they would discount like crazy, like 45, 50, like at a loss, like <sighs> all of these things just to clear the inventory. And then our store would be swamped by all these people we would oh, never see. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Art, like, art collectors. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Kincaid heads. Kincaid heads. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's like uh so all of a sudden we'd 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 be swamped and then they would people would just be like total assholes about it. And because like the thing is is that they'd be hung up super high and then you'd yeah. and then you'd have yeah, yeah, to get yeah. like a thing and, and try to get it down and right. pack it. Um and I don't know if it was because we were in a mall or whatever, but people were, I think people are assholes or wherever you go, mm, uh, yeah. especially to retail workers. Like yes. people just have such low thresholds uh, for, and are so rude to retail workers. Yep. Um, especially one of the things that I remember <laughs> for me, what was the fad for you guys? For, Cause for me it was prayer of Jabez. Like that oh, was, yeah. we had an entire section like right by the register, it was like the impulse buy. Like it was the little impulse buy section was a whole thing just full of prayer Jabez tchotchkes, like little <laughs> medallions and small yeah. versions of the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the book and nesting dolls. And <laughs> I was there on the latter half of the purpose driven life fad. So yeah. we had a lot of that stuff. I was there but some time. more than anything, Lifeway has an exclusive contract with Beth Moore. So that's the only place you can buy Beth Moore books. It, at least like it, the only bookstore where you can buy Beth Moore books. You're right. Like the work books. Meyer, boy, so, so huh. we, so we would get like, she would come out with a new workbook and we would get like 50 boxes of it. I'm not exaggerating. We would oh, get I like 50 it, yeah. boxes of it. And yeah. we had this like, we had this buyer, like the buyers for Lifeway are really, really, really unprofessional and have no idea what they're doing. So we were constantly overstocked on anything that was an exclusive Lifeway product, whether it was like, you know, made in China, like, like cross trinkets that looked like shit, or if it was <laughs> Beth Moore books. So me, me and like, so my, I could tell stories all day because I worked there with like five of my best friends Aww. and we, we got like really ridiculous some days, like really ridiculous. But like the, a big part of our job was literally finding physical space in the store to put things and rearranging <laughs> it to like fit all these Beth Moore books in like the overstock shelves. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Like we had so much product in house all the time. And it was always this like stress fest of like trying to figure out where to put anything. Yeah. And they got shipments every morning. It sounds like you guys needed Beth less. Yeah. We needed Beth less. <laughs> <laughs> I was there during. So do you get- I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was there for like purpose driven life, prayer of J best shit. Um, but I also remember like the Clay Aiken book came out. Not that that was ever a big deal. It just really fucking bothered me. But the, 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 what was it? The shack was a thing because, you know, I definitely came from the background where like, no, that doesn't fly. There's no way God's black. Yeah. There's no way that, yeah, that it, well, I mean, they were basically just recreating tests from touched by an angel. It felt like. <laughs> but you know, that was like very much against the rules, but I was a huge Frank Peretti head. Oh God. Okay. Um, one, but, of you, one of you people, yeah. but my weirdest thing, uh, I'm going to tell this story really quick cause I do not want to think about it for much longer. And it, it involves <laughs> a older, I, I need to go. So that'll be a really good yeah, trigger warning. But there, there was a, uh, there, I, I walked outside to throw the trash out once, and there was a guy who was in a car in our loading dock uh, d- 
pleasuring himself naked. <laughs> and I was the only guy who worked at the bookstore. It was just me and a bunch of older women, <laughs> you know, who like literally were friends with my grandmother. Oh my right. So like, thank God I was the one who walked out because that would have been horrible. But like, I like walked in and like went to my manager and I was just casually like, uh, there was a guy like, you, you, you know, he was, t- t- <laughs> there was a guy in the, in the back, he wasn't wearing clothes and he was like, you know, t- <laughs> ma'am, uh, he was touching himself. And so I had to like call the cops and do oh my shit. God. they found him. Evidently that's just a thing he does. Okay. I think he gets a thrill because it's a Christian bookstore, but yeah, yeah. Well, Blake. his face. Oh, he was terrified. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> yeah. On that note, <laughs> uh, it's been a pleasure. Do you have any favorite Blake, Gerbert songs? Blake you'd like to sing? God damn it. <laughs> Blake Chastain, host of Exvangelical, pioneer of the Exvangelical movement, brother of Jessica, featured on CBS <laughs> special. What's the name of the What's the name of the show on the special, Blake? It's a, it's called uh, Deconstructing My Religion. You can find it on YouTube on the CBS Religion channel. Yep. Uh, their channel there on YouTube and also on CBS on demand and all those other places. Very that, cool. Right next to Star yeah, Trek. Very worth watching. That's right. Um, keep your ears peeled for the uh, the upcoming um, ears and eyes for the upcoming um, conference that, that Blake and crew are planning. Decon yeah. Con. Decon Con. We're naming it here. Yeah, yeah, we, con. Exclusive. I'm just right. kidding. Uh, <laughs> featuring us. We already signed the contract. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Blake, <laughs> thanks so much for being on the show. Um, yeah, thanks for having check me. out Exvangelical. It's a great podcast. Um, and uh, if you don't go to church, get out of it. <laughs> Sunday is just the <laughs> second, second Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> I love it. <laughs>